John 12, chapter 12, uh, verse 12 to 19. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign, Jesus done this sign. Verse 19. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see? That you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Let us uh, appeal to the Lord that his words will be fruitful, fruitful to us. Oh God, be merciful to us sinners. Oh God, have mercy on us. According to your mercy, according to your kindness, oh God, uh, blot out our transgressions before you. Lord, you are a mighty God. You are our King. But you are a king that is a humble king, oh God, Lord, and we give glory to you, oh God. One, once in your life you came uh, riding on a donkey, but we know, oh Lord, that you one day will come uh, to gather us again, riding on a white horse called faithful and true. Oh Lord, we long for that day. Oh Lord, we glory on that day, but we also glory on the first day that you came to this world uh, dying on a cross. Because that is our song, O oh God. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Worthy are you, O oh Lord, to, give us to, be, to be praised and glorified, O oh God. O oh Spirit of oh the Lord, may we ask you that you will open our hearts and you open our minds, O oh God, so that we may see more, not of us, O oh God, but more of Christ and more of Christ and more of Christ. Mm. He is our King. He is our Lord. Mm. He is our God and we worship Him. Oh, Lord, be with us. Open our eyes and open our minds. Oh, God. We praise you. In Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Oh, dear church, we are, as you know, as you are aware, we are on the middle of the narrative of the Passion Week. Uh, it, is, it is a very hectic week. Actually, a lot of things has been happening. And if you study, uh, you know, you, if you do your readings, actually, it, it, it is a, you can actually track everything, everything that has been happening throughout the week. So Monday, Tuesday, until Friday, and then, and then on Sunday when the Lord re resurrected Himself. So it is a very week, and we find ourselves uh, here on the next day, right after um, uh, Mary anointed it, Jesus Christ uh, uh, using the perfume, uh, well, well, fragrant perfume, uh, which we have discussed last week. So for, for the sake of time, I won't deal much uh, on a re uh, revision of what we, has act we had actually done. So go to the website, go to the YouTube uh, page, so we, all the uh, teachings has been uh, is uploaded there. But here we have a very, actually it's a very, uh, uh, a very important part of uh, redemptive history. Here, Christ is now going to Jerusalem. Here is the culmination of all the things that have been that has been uh, uh, proclaimed, preached, and planned by the Lord. Here now he's like a king marching to his throne. Hey, but his throne is not made of 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 a, of a, of, a, of, a, of a throne like Solomon. His throne is the cross, mm. and he is marching humbly, like a, uh, on, on a donkey, not on a war horse. So this is what we are going to discuss uh, for, for this morning. Let me just give you this message. This is the, what the preaching is all about this morning. This is a simple message for us, just a simple sentence. Um, Jesus is a spiritual Messiah. He is a spiritual Messiah. I hope that's uh, clear for you to understand and, and maybe it, it will be elaborated more as we go on uh, through this text. But we, we have uh, two major points uh, this morning. Number one is the misguided devotion of the crowd. So we are going to discuss majority, bulk of our time discussing uh, the, this misguided devotion of the crowd. They were looking, number one, for political Messiah. But Christ want, well, Christ's proclamation and, and stand is this. I'm not a political messiah. I am a spiritual messiah. I'm not a savior of your savior from the Roman Empire. I'm your savior uh, against 
God himself. So we were going to discuss majority of our time in uh, three, these three verses, 12 to 15. And then lastly, uh, a few comments uh, here for the sake of time. Uh, we will discuss a bit more on the reaction, the mixed reactions from the crowd. So verses 16 uh, to 19, we can see the disciples that were actually confused. Uh, the, the crowd was actually curious as well. And here we can also see the Pharisees confounded and chagrined and aghast. And, and, and it's the same in a bit of a desperate situation. Hey, look at this. Christ is already gaining the whole world. So we will see a uh, uh, few comments on, on that. So why don't we jump into our text now? So big text, major text in, in the life, in the redemptive history uh, of, of Christ. So here, number one, let's go to the first part. Misguided devotion uh, of the crowd. The misguided devotion of the crowd. So that's on uh, verse 12 to 14. Verse 12 to 14. Let us note several details here that the Apostle, Apostle John has written for us. So first of all, it says, uh, this is a, this is a uh, momentous background. So here, I was going to read to you verse 12. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming uh, to Jerusalem. Uh, as we know, this is the great triumphant entry to Jerusalem. Um, um, we, 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 we can probably, of course, if we, it's something that is very familiar to us. But again, the problem is, if it's familiar, we lose the, sometimes, sometimes the understanding of what is it really all about. If we think that it's just about uh, Christ gaining the whole world uh, through political means, no, that, that is not. That is not the point of this passage. So here, Christ is uh, uh, riding to Jerusalem on a donkey, but nothing triumphant in a way. Uh, in, in, in this, uh, based on oh, the reason why he is actually doing it, there's nothing triumphant on the reason why he's doing that. So here we have um, we have Christ, and let's listen to Romans. Sorry, John eleven. Verse 16. <coughs> John eleven sixteen. So Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us go, and that we may also die with him. He's not gaining anything. He's not gaining the kingdom, or the, the kingdom of Israel back to himself. Uh, even Thomas said, right, uh, let's go. We're going to Jerusalem, and we're going to die. And let's just go and die with him. That's in, in their mindset. Matthew 26, verse 35, Peter said to him, Matthew 26, verse 35, Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you, Lord. So they are aware, they are aware that their Christ is not conquering the kingdom, conquering a kingdom, but they are actually going there to die. All, right, all, the, all, the, all the disciples said the same, so that is the overall mood. We are going to Jerusalem and we will die with him. So when, when they saw all the people cheering for Christ, actually Christ entering Jerusalem and everyone's cheering, they're, they're all amazed. What's happening? I thought we were going to Jerusalem and we're going to be killed. The, this account is present in, in four Gospels in, in varying details. I don't have time to actually discuss everything to you, so, but you can find it in Matthew 21, verses 1 to 11, Luke chapter 19, verses 28 onwards, and uh, Mr. Mark here, but uh, also chapter, uh, Mark chapter 14, I think, in Mark. We may not cover everything again, but for the, for the sake of time. But let's examine verse 12. Let's examine verse 12. Not, note number one here, the context. The context. Let's examine the day. The next day. The previous day, of course, was when Mary anointed Jesus Christ. Uh, here we, we see, I, was, um, I need to point out to you, the divine schedule being, uh, being uh, providentially and, and uh, sovereignly worked out. We are on the last week of Christ, and the last few days uh, before He sacrificed Himself to the cross. And, and as uh, we have mentioned repeatedly uh, to you in, in, in this pulpit, it is a divine schedule. Everything is planned and no one can thwart the, the plan of the Lord. So on, on that day, he planned to ride into to Jerusalem. And on that day, that plan will happen. It is happening here before our very eyes. So that's the day. Next day, right after Mary. Look at the crowd. Let me be. Look at the crowd. The next day, the large crowd had, had come. Here, John painted a picture for us. 
a large crowd was, was waiting for Jesus. So Jesus, uh, coming from Bethany, had a large crowd uh, waiting for him uh, on, before the gates of Jerusalem. NIV said, uh, uh, rendered it this way, a great <coughs> crowd. The King James says, much, uh, much people. Uh, the the NASB said, a great uh, multitude. The, 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 the word here is actually picturesque. Uh, the word here is, uh, has uh, uh, Greek, which we, we can use as, uh, we, where we use the word echo. Echo. So echo is not singular. Oh, echo is, there's no one single echo. Echo reverberates. Echo uh, tends to, uh, to further, uh, to, to say one word and to say it repeatedly. There's some, some, some sort of, 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 of confusion and, and many noises and, and the crowd was, was gathering. There was some, some sort of commotion. They're filled with noise and, and all the hustling and the bustling of the crowd. So that's what's happening here. Christ entering Jerusalem and the people are, are in a great commotion. Why? John 11, verses 55 to 56 says, Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand. Many went up from the country to Jerusalem, from Galilee to Jerusalem, before the Passover to purify themselves. Verse 56, They were looking for Jesus, saying to one another, Is he going to the feast? Is he going to the feast at all? What do you think? So there's like this anticipation. And all the crowd was asking, Oh, Jesus is coming to the feast. Oh, this is the Passover. Will he reveal himself? There's an anticipation and question. Will Jesus reveal himself to the Pharisees? Again, remember, it is over the background of an existing arrest warrant uh, to him. And it is simultaneous, the great mir mir miracle of, of Lazarus. Now they knew that, he, he, that Jesus was actually uh, going to Jerusalem and they're eager to this crowd, are eager to meet him. Now also here, so we have a crowd waiting for Jesus in Jerusalem. But here uh, in verse 17, notice this, the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb. So there's a crowd waiting for Jerusalem, waiting in Jerusalem, and there's a crowd with Jesus uh, from Bethany, those who actually witnessed uh, the, uh, the, the miracle of, of Jesus Christ. So, so there's plenty of, of people, and uh, there's, a, there's a sense of waiting and anticipation. Uh, Josephus said, uh, there, there, during this time, this is Passover, there are around uh, 2 million people gathering uh, during this, uh, on that small city uh, of Jerusalem. It is plenty, plenty of people. We, we, can actually very, we cannot actually verify his account. It could be exaggerated, but uh, his point really is that plenty of people. Adelaide Oval, for example, is, is capacity is, is 53,000. What if 53,000, uh, when you enter through that, through that oval, you can actually hear and be overwhelmed by the people, uh, overwhelmed by the number of people. Imagine uh, the 50 times more, more than that. And they are here waiting, waiting for Christ. Oh, dear church, uh, remember, let me point this one to you, how sovereign our Lord is. There were no TV during that time. There were no uh, internet broadcasts at all. But God, through His sovereign work, a uh, gathered multitude of people so that all of them will actually witness what was going to happen on this great day. Remember Romans chapter 3, verse 25. God publicly displayed Jesus Christ. Listen to Martin Lloyd's sermon and he rendered it this way. God, a placard, Jesus Christ, displaying to the whole world that this Christ is the Savior of the world. And you, you must know this. As if God advertising Jesus on a gigantic billboard so that everyone can see that the Lord is the Savior of the world. Oh, dear friends, it's a momentous event. Though we are not here, we are not there. Physically, it is being displayed right before our very eyes in the scripture of the word of the living God. Oh, he's proclaiming himself, declaring himself to be the savior of the world. Your savior. Your savior. So that is, that is what is happening here. We have the crowd, but also notice the occasion. Verse 12, the occasion. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast. So, of course, we know that it is a Passover. Passover, it is 
mentioned in a in previous chapter, it is an annual holiday uh, required by it in which every male is required to go up to Jerusalem to offer their sacrifices and to um, um, celebrate Passover. Not mentioned here, of course, is uh, you must also remember that Passover is just a one day. It's just one day. But after that is the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. Feast of the Unleavened Bread by which they will commemorate that uh, through haste, they don't have actually time to bake something. So they were going out of Egypt uh, and the Lord is going to redeem them now at this point, at this hour. Uh, so, so they have they need to get some provisions uh, for them so that they don't have to they don't have the time to prepare a meal and they what they have is just a, just a, a simple meal of a, uh, made from an unleavened bread they, this is a commemoration it lasts for uh, seven to eight days so passover and then feast of the unleavened bread so so they, they, they imagine this this is a whole holiday uh, come, uh, happening in in this in this chapter this year or oh, actually not this year but next year it will uh, so that we have like a time work and time frame it, it will it's passover ha will happen 2019 on 19th of april and then next day after that 20th to 26th is the feast of the undead and even bread so so it is uh, we, we must situate ourselves in, in that time timeline so passover and the feast of the unleavened bread letter b the manner by which they knew jesus christ is coming the manner Verse 12, the next day, the large of the crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. Jesus was the talk of the town. He's the talk of the town. Jesus is the main headline of the news. If you are into marketing and social engineering, he's the this number one trending. He's on the number one trending list. They heard that Jesus is coming. Our one people knew that Jesus was going to Jerusalem and like a wildfire. The news uh, actually spread all over the town. Remember Paul? When he was before King Agrippa? Paul said, King Agrippa, you know this. It wasn't done in the corner. Mm. You know this. It cannot escape your attention. And my, my, my dear friends, my dear uh, uh, church, the gospel of Christ is true. It happens, and we know this. It's not uh, even though many scholars, many historians will try to hide what had happened, and and they will try to uh, use their relativistic interpretation of, of what has happened to history and historiography. Oh, well, let me tell you, it happened. Yeah. It was a done in a corner. It was uh, elevated as if broadcasted to the whole world. Oh, God is sovereign and He can actually do that. Oh, dear friend, you are aware that that's going to be a challenge for you. If you are not yet in Christ, you don't have, you cannot say like, oh, don't know. You know. What does you want to know? That you are a sinner before God. That you cannot place yourself before God. That you need your Savior. Christ is your Passover Lamb. He will sacrifice himself for the love of the Father for your good if you put your trust in him. And that's the message 2,000 years ago. And that's the same message, the same news. This is not the stale news of, of, of current time. This is the wonderful news of Christianity. Amen. Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, your Savior. And I'm telling you right now, you must know it. And you, you cannot escape uh, this truth. I wasn't done in the corner. Oh, you know this, dear friend. Oh, however, however commendable the crowd was, as Jesus entered Jerusalem, they were crying out, cheering up for them. It seems, though, that majority of them did not understand what is happening. It's, 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 like, the, it's like the narrative of the whole John, really. It's, it's Christ doing this stuff, and the majority of them don't understand why uh, let's let's move on to uh, to the next verse note to they wanted a political messiah verse 13 says they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and uh, crying out Hosanna Hosanna bless, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord even the king of Israel here we can fully see that they are actually devoted to the Lord. They are devoted to the Lord. They are enthusiastic about the Lord, uh, but about the about what is happening. 
but not on what the Lord has promised for them. They saw the opportunity now uh, to install Jesus at the throne. Uh, they were thinking that this, this is the most appropriate time to rebuild the kingdom of God so that they will become more imminent nation, uh, just like their old glorious days. Well, uh, Jesus raised someone from the dead. What else is impossible for him? He's on the kill list. He's on the hit list by, by the Pharisees. Yet here he is. Revealing himself, surely he is marching now to claim what a Messiah should claim. That's not what they're thinking. That's what uh, they want a kingdom. These Jews want a kingdom uh, for themselves. Look at what the paraphernalia they're using. Look at the things that they're using to 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 uh, uh, to emphasize that claim. Let verse thirteen branches of the palm trees, branches of the palm trees. So they took branches of the palm trees. Uh, it is, uh, palm trees are, are symbols of royalty and kinship and victory and triumph. Uh, the great uh, Australian commentator Leon Morris said, uh, it, said it this way, palms were an emblem of victory. Uh, Carson said it again, it commented in this way, uh, palm branches may well have signaled the nationalistic hope that a messianic liberator was arriving at the scene. It was just a national symbol, similar to, to what, what, you, what we have in Australia, the symbol that we use. And it evokes some sort of nationalism in us. That's our nation. That's where we are. And this just by waving these branches, we're declaring, hey, this is our nationalistic hope. This emblem emphasizes the victory that we have as a Jewish nation. So they were waving the branches. Also, verse 13, uh, look at this. What else are they using? Passionate cry and cheer. A passionate cry and cheer. Verse 13, they took branches of the palm trees and went out uh, to meet him, crying out. They were crying out. The, uh, the Greek says, it's a continuously cry. Uh, continuously cry. It never stops. And imagine, uh, if you've been to the Adelaide Oval, you know, imagine the cry of the people when, when, uh, when a person uh, uh, made a goal or something. Uh, imagine the cry of the crowd. Millions of people crowd at the front and crowd at, with Jesus Christ, crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna. They welcome Christ with much uh, cheer and applause. Uh, it's, it's so, so much emotion and enthusiasm. Oh, put yourself in the, in, the, in the Jewish shoes. They were waiting for a Messiah like David. They were waiting for a long promised king. And along the background, they were oppressed by the Gentile world. They were oppressed by the Syrians, by, by the Romans, by the Greek. Yet now, finally, here is Christ revealing himself. He seems to be our king. Oh, our long-established kingdom of David and Solomon will be, will be established again. And then they look at those golden old days where, where, they, where every nation would look up, look up to them. Oh, it, 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 their hearts probably were burning with desire, a political desire, a political desire. One of the most glorious um, or military parade happened in, in Moscow. So there was, it, it happened in June uh, 25, 1945. June 24, 1945. Uh, it was when the Red Army, the Russian Army, had finally captured Berlin. And Hitler was there. And remember, during that time, it, uh, and, uh, the German uh, forces were quite powerful. But they, the, the, the Russians overwhelmed the whole Nazi empire. 40,000 men of them are walking gallantly, walking with so much pride, with all their battle gears, with all their, 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 uh, their AK-47s and all, those, all those, those guns that they have. Oh, they were triumph, marching in triumph. Oh, probably it was in similar manner, in similar manner. That's what the Jews are looking for, a king who will march down against the Roman Empire. So, what do they have? National in, uh, emblem, poem, a passionate cry. What else? Wow, I got a biblical text. Wait, they got a biblical text. Verse, uh, let us see, verse 13. So they cry, were crying out. Uh, the, they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king 
of Israel. Well, Simeon is getting uh, legitimate now. We have a king. We have the royal symbol. Our hearts are burning in us. Now we need a biblical text to support it. And it's fortunate that we do have one. It's in Psalm 118 verses 25 to 26. I um, will quickly read this one to you. Save us, O Lord. Psalm 118, verses 25 to 26. Save us, O Lord. We pray. Give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. We are studying uh, our break. In, in, uh, so we're studying Psalms. So this is Psalm 118. We will probably study more of this after like probably of the next, in the next 10 years. But we will go there. But the whole point of Psalm is this. This is a messianic Psalm. A, a Psalm of, of victory. They were waiting for the, for the, for the Davidic king to actually enter, the, in, enter into Jerusalem. And then the one, once, the, the, once uh, Solomon or any any son of David will come into Jerusalem. They were crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, the Lord, uh, save us. They were uttering uh, a word of prayer, Hosanna, literally means, Lord, save us now. It's a word of prayer for, of, of their salvation. But it's also a word of praise. It's a pray of a, it's a it's, it's praising God because they are confident that God will actually save them now. So they were they were filled with emotions. They were filled uh, with with uh, with with this messianic uh, hope and anticipation. Uh, here, Christ seems to be finally saving the whole Israel and will destroy all the Gentile world. Verse thirteen: Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. However, they interpreted it this way. Even the king of Israel, uh, it's, it's, it, which of course, that, that king of Israel is the Messiah. He is the Savior. However, that, that is interpreted wrongly. In what way? Well, Christ is not the Messiah like David. Killing Goliath. Well, he's here to conquer more than Goliath. It's our sin. Is here to satisfy not just the Jewish people, but our Lord God Himself. Even the King of Israel, that it is their interpretation of 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 a Messiah that has the political power. And this is a, this is my repeated word now. I think you're probably getting used to it, but it's for politics and and, and in that in that kind of Messiah. One commentator, Bruce Milne, said this way. He moves majestically, majestically forward in procession to his throne, a throne constructed by his enemies, the throne of the cross. However, they misinterpreted the text. They missed the text. Uh, the, the great American expositor, uh, Lewis Johnson, said it this way in, his, in one of his sermons. They were praising him as the king, but they were also blaspheming him by omitting the fact that he is a king, who is a king by virtue of a cross. And, by, and so, by excluding the cross, they were really attacking the Savior, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, you can say all that all day long, Hosanna, Hosanna. But you, if you interpreted it wrongly, then you miss the point. And that's what is happening right here and right now. But my, my whole point here in this one, in this major section, is this: uh, that Israel, the Jewish people during this time, are misguided by their political ambition, emotional condition and wrong biblical interpretation. That is what is happening in this kind of devotion uh, through political ambition. Because of, what, because of their political ambition, because of their emotional condition, and wrong uh, biblical interpretation. But here, note. Last note here before we go for application. Note 3, Jesus is a spiritual <coughs> Messiah. He is a spiritual Messiah. Verse 14 to 15. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on him. Just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on the donkey's colt. Here, uh, Jesus, of course, is aware of what is happening. He's aware of the insurrection frenzy happening during this time. And, and God rebuked them, not with words, but with action. Look at the humility of our king. Humility of our king. He rode on a donkey that has never been sat before. Verse 14, uh, Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. 
Uh, to write on a donkey, Carson said, uh, immediately after the acclamation of the crowd has the effect of, of dumping down nationalist expectation. He does not enter Jerusalem in a war horse. It's a downer. It's a disappointment to people. They want the king on a horse. They want a majestic king, a, a king full of gallant, uh, that had a sense of victory and triumph. Well, if you see a donkey, if you, if you see how a donkey walks, or how a donkey runs, it's very awkward. But if you see a war horse, it's, it's, it's just majestic. Oh, they want that. They want power. We want a king who is powerful and strong. Amidst, uh, 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 amidst the bravado of that world during that time, the proud uh, arrogance of the, that world during that time, amidst the many notions of power, they, they want a king that is on that, state, on that level. And dear church, isn't, isn't it tempting for us, dear church, to be somehow like the world, mm -hmm. to be as powerful as the world, mm -hmm. to use those means employed by the world so that we will be influential in this world? Oh, it's tempting. It's tempting. But no, it's not only the humility of our king, but the peace from our king. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming. Verse 15. The sitting on the tongue is called not only was a donkey a symbol of humility, but it's also a symbol of peace. It's a symbol of peace. The point here is already made and emphasized by Jesus. He came to bring peace. His name, his name is Prince of Peace. Remember in his nativity, when all the angels are gathering before, before the skies and praising, praising God, the, the angels, the hosts of heaven, crying out glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to all men. Or Romans chapter 5 verse 1, Therefore, since we are, we are justified by Christ, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Lord here, is a, is a king who wants peace. That's why the prophecy for us is, uh, is, is, is exhorted us not to fear. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Exhort, it exhorted us, it's exhorting us not to fear. Uh, it's actually in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 9. Go up on a high mountain, uh, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Fear not, say, says the cities of Judah. Mm -hmm. Oh, our Lord comes in peace. Fear not, dear church. But also this prophecy in, in Zechariah exhorted us to look on Jesus Christ. To look on Jesus Christ. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on the donkey's colt. Is in Zechariah chapter nine, verse nine. Just read it on your own. So here, uh, Christ is coming on a donkey with all, with this uh, with this uh, prophecy in his mind, and he said, "Like I will fulfill this prophecy. Fear not, Jerusalem. Uh, come and look at me. I am your savior." Uh, my point here in this. As I end this major section here is this. Jesus did not come to give us inner peace or political peace or any vague notions of peace. The peace that he offered is not mere emotional state but a proclamation of, 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 of peace to them. Peace to us. A peace of, from God. A peace of God. And a peace with God. That's the whole point of this. It, uh, what, 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 what will inner peace do to us? What will emotional peace do to us? Nothing. What this political peace and, and us living in a, in, a, uh, in a good nation can do to us? What? Nothing. But we want a peace that comes from God. A peace with God. A peace of God. Amen. Our application here, let, let, let me uh, quickly uh, apply this for us in our lives. Number one, if you are not yet in Christ, fear not, come to the Lord. Oh, that is, I think, the, the, the very, uh, the very uh, point of this. Oh, your king is coming before your eyes. Oh, fear not, oh, come to the Lord. Rejoice, oh, oh you who, 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 was, who wants peace. In God, come to the Lord. Why will you be afraid of Him? Yes, you have the. You, it's legitimate for you to be afraid of Him. You've sinned against Him. But here we have a Christ riding on a donkey, bringing tidings of peace unto you. Oh, 
oh, if you are not in Christ, come. And the, the, uh, and, and, and the challenge to you is this. Look to the Lord. Fear not, Jerusalem. But behold, your king is coming. And as if right here, right now, your king, if you are not in Christ, is marching towards you right now and calling you uh, proclamations of peace if you will yield to him right here. Oh, that's a call for you if you are not yet in Christ. And my dear uh, friends, if you are not yet in Christ today, oh, please, please don't uh, do this for tomorrow. We don't know what tomorrow has uh, for us. The call is now. Behold, now. But also, dear, dear friends, and come from the dear church, as a church, also let us employ the God or the means to expand this kingdom. So let us employ the God ordained means to expand this kingdom. As mentioned, the church can clearly be tempted to leverage itself to the worldly power. The church wanted to be relevant. The church wanted to, 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 to be like the world, to gain the world, and thus to talk like the world, and speak like the world, and use means of the world like power and entertainment and politics. Oh, instead, dear church, let us be firm on the humble ways of the kingdom of God. We are not riding on a horse gallantly and parading ourselves to everyone. But we, like Christ, is treading, riding on the donkey with gentleness and meekness. Oh, dear church, consider the humble means by which the Lord has given to us which the Lord has given to us. A preaching of the word, the, the, the preacher of the word, and the preached word itself. Oh, there is no something uh, magnificent about this, all this tree. Look at the preaching of the world, preaching of the word, preaching of the Bible. There's nothing glorious to this. You want powerful preaching, powerful proclamation? Well, on September 11, 2001, a week after that, George W. Bush proclaimed war against Iran. That's powerful. You want powerful preaching, powerful proclamation? Go to the Senate. Uh, they will pass all the laws and it has power to change a nation. Preaching of the word, this one. Oh, seriously. It will not change the world if you're in a worldly sense. The preacher of the word, me, your pastor, we cannot change the world. We will never change the world if we use our, if we employ our, our occult occupation and all our influence because we got nothing. And look at me right here and right now. After this, I'm just a one a simple man who will go back to my study and live to my own little world. And the Lord, and many times I've asked the Lord, will you use me? I know you can. Oh, look at the preacher of the word and many of them, light them all up. They are nothing before men. And look at the preached word. Your gospel. Our gospel. Oh, our gospel said, oh, bow down before the king. Oh, bow down before. But, oh, oh, well, we will use this preaching of the world. We will use the preacher of the world. We will still use the preach of the world. Why? So that the glory of God may be magnified all the more. And we will cry out to the who are our king. All oh, hail, Redeemer, hail. Oh, Lord, glory is forever and eternal. Oh, God, you are worthy of our praise. For thou hast died for me. Your praise shall never, never fail throughout eternity. And oh, oh may us, may us, oh Lord, be humbled all the more and be cast down into it to this, uh, to the lower state we can so that after the preaching of the word, Christ, my King, will be glorified. Oh, we want the glory not for ourselves, but the glory for our King. Oh, therefore, the church, Dear friends, let us employ and be confident on the, on the means that by which the Lord has given to us. <clears throat> Preaching of the world has the power to save souls Amen. and to give glory to God Amen. and to edify you, dear saints. 
Oh, praise God in the highest heaven. Oh, praise Him. That's why the reformers, after preaching the word, they cry, that cry really is solitary of Gloria to God on the whole the praise because He deserves all the praise, not us. Not us. Therefore, church, let us be confident in, the, in this uh, means by which the Lord has given to us. And then lastly, last one here. <coughs> let us beware of false, false enthusiasm. As, uh, again, Lewis Johnson said it this way in, the, in his sermon, emotional enthusiasm for Christ is far different from earnest faith uh, to him. That's what's happening to the crowd. Oh, oh, we want glory to the God, to, to God in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna. The, their hearts are actually filled with, with emotion. Oh, we can be carried away with emotion. Uh, similar to what the crowd has felt. Uh, this could be, you know, temporary <coughs> fervor and affection to Christ. But what is the point of John? So that you feel that Christ is the, is the Son of God? No. So that you know and you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And what? By believing and by knowing. Have eternal life. You will have eternal life. Therefore, dear friends, uh, it's amazing how much Christianity right now is being swayed by emotionalism. Uh, they are defining Christian experience on, 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 on what they felt. How was the worship? Oh, it's good. It felt good to me. How was the Sunday, uh, Sunday service? Was God there? Yeah, I was happy. Uh, so the song makes me happy. The fellowship makes me happy. Listen to me, dear congregation. Christianity does not value emotion. Indeed, it, it, it redeems emotion after properly placing it on the knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's why we can cry out, my heart is filled with gratefulness, with thankfulness. That's emotion. Why? To Him who bore my pain, who found the depths of my disgrace, and who gave me life again, who cursed, who crushed the curse of sinfulness, and brought His law of righteousness into my heart. Oh, heart should be filled with gratefulness and thankfulness to the Lord, to the knowledge that Jesus Christ died for you. Oh, church, let us be aware of in false enthusiasm, similar to the crowd. I may not be able to finish this one, but if you will be on uh, Sunday, uh, Wednesday service, probably a <coughs> Wednesday Bible study, we will talk, discuss more on the small section here on on John chapter 12. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we crown you with many crowns.